uh, for coming. Um, we, uh, I'm really grateful to our friends of the Danish government for helping us um, support this work on demand-driven approach to development. I want to really thank Romina Bandura, who's not here, and Mackenzie Hammond, who did a really great job. Mackenzie is back there, and thanks, Mackenzie, for all your hard work. But I thought this was a, a pretty, a really good primer on uh, what is demand-driven development. It means lots of different things to lots of different people. Uh, there's several things that I, I want to emphasize that um, this concept, I, th I think, uh, has has taken on a lot more salience uh, for a number of reasons, including the Paris Accra Busan Global Partnership uh, track, if you will. Uh, and I also think that it's taken on a lot more salience in the post-Cold War world. Um, and, I want, and I also think the other point I'd want to make is that I think the emergence of a variety of technologies that have reached uh, poor people all over the world, and specifically social media and cell phones, that we know a lot more about what people want, and we know it more cheaply and more quickly than we've ever known before. And then finally, I think we know a lot more about what works and what doesn't work in development. And so I think all of those things have prompted us to want to put this together. And, and I really appreciate um, my friends for um, helping me to uh, uh, get, this, get this going. Um, we've got some really thoughtful people um, who are helping us with this. My friend, Tessie San Martin, who's the president and CEO of Plan International, but also wears another hat. Um, at the, uh, the MFAN network that I'm sure she'll ta she can tell you about. And then Colin Christensen, who is uh, the Africa Director for Government Relations and General Partner for w the One Acre Fund, and spent the last several years living in Africa. And then we have um, Jebre um, Tesfamish, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna mangle the last name. Some people have a hard time with my last name too, so my friend Jebre. Jebre, who is the former finance minister of Eritrea, but also has been a longtime consultant and advisor to institutions like the World Bank um, and, uh, and uh, also uh, an independent uh, development professional here. So I think we've got several really thoughtful people to help us unpack this. I'm gonna start with my friend Tessie to kick this off. Tessie, thanks for being here. Uh, oh, thanks. So, uh, well, and we, in the previous discussion that we were in. In the uh, pre-game. In the pre-game, there was a pre-game before this one. Um, uh, we, you know, I had, I, I had a, a, a few observations and then maybe I'll add uh, one more, you know, as a basis, uh, based on that previous discussion. Um, so my, my first observation is that, uh, you know, this report is, is uh, quite, uh, quite useful in terms of distilling what, what I think are elements of, you know, a modern approach to foreign assistance. Um, you know, the, the elements that are highlighted in the report uh, around, you know, country ownership, around inclusive partnership, around including local actors, untying aid and accountability, those are, you know, elements of what, you know, certainly at, at MFAN we, uh, we talk about in terms of, you know, essential, an essential foundation to a modern foreign assistance. Um, and, and I will also say that I don't think that by sort of incorporating all of these elements in your approach to foreign assistance, you can guarantee uh, that foreign uh, assistance is going to always be you know, impactful and sustainable. But I think you can for sure uh, say that you're gonna be reducing the risk that foreign assistance is going to be wasteful uh, and that uh, it's going to do harm uh, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, you, you know, at, at the very least. So there's some risk that this approach reduces uh, and, and we believe, and I think, you know, uh, more research is, uh, is always a useful thing that, that, that this approach uh, to development produces better results. Uh, but I do think that we you know, do need research. And there's some, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I was reflecting on a, a report from the World Bank that I was reading um, to just illustrate uh, this point. And they were doing a review of their community-driven development. 
uh, which amounts to about $7 billion mm -hmm. in that portfolio. And, and it was interesting because that report found that so they were basically looking at the level of you know, community inclusion and whether or not that had an effect on the outcomes you know, that were supposed to be produced. Um, and, and, um, and what they found is that the level of inclusion didn't necessarily affect the outcome. Even though the outcome of a lot of these projects were actually what they expected them to be, the level of inclusion, uh, the level of community ownership wasn't always um, you know, correlated to it. So that's one thing that you know, we need to unpack. But the, the, the part I wanted to sort of highlight is that they also found that, well, who are you including in that development conversation? So when you say demand driven, whose demand do you care about? And, uh, and what they found is that by and large, many of these projects were captured by elites. That if you really cared about the very, very poor and the very marginalized, those people were not part of that inclusion that that project uh, addressed. So, I, uh, so that leads me to sort of the second comment. Okay, so these are really important principles, um, but unpacking them uh, is uh, quite a, a challenge. Uh, the issue of country ownership, right? And that's what I just illustrated. So when you say country ownership, who in the country are you talking about? The government, the private sector, civil society, the poorest, the most marginalized? And if you really care about that last group, how are you including them? Those are, those are and, and by the way, when you include them, what risks are you creating for them? That's a separate conversation which we can, which we can have, question. right? And so I, I think that there's a lot to unpack in this, but this report is really um, a, a useful way of sort of distilling the key elements and allowing for a more systemic and rational conversation about what are really you know, important issues. Uh, a couple of other comments, if I may. Um, one, um, you know, when I think about, you know, uh, demand-driven development, it really does mean empowering, right? Empowering the country to take charge of its own development. But if you empower the, but, but what does that mean for you as a donor? If you're empowering someone, it almost means by definition that you're ceding power to them. And as a donor, are you willing to do that? And we had a very interesting conversation in, in, in the pregame. You know, well, about, say, for example, consider the politics of foreign assistance here, right? The, uh, the, the price of getting support for the 150 account is you know, that um, you're uh, maybe uh, uh, funding a whole bunch of priorities that have very little to do with what the countries are demanding. But that's the price of getting everybody aligned and everybody online and getting things funded at the level that you want to see you know, foreign assistance funding. So, um, so and, and by the way, uh, you know, uh, to, to a point that was made in the, in the earlier discussion, when I talk about donors, uh, and sort of the whole landscape, I think we have to include organizations like my own. Um, you know, uh, we too uh, have to figure out how to become more demand driven. And as somebody mentioned earlier, you know, organizations like myself cannot pretend that all our funding is demand driven. I'm sorry, you know what? My donors say that they like, you know, education and protection. I've got a lot of education and protection money. I have less money for something else that a country might want because it turns out that my donors are less interested. So I'm I'm dealing with the same issues, and I think all of us in this community need to align around it. This is not just an, a, a sort of OECD donor or broadly bilateral, multilateral donor discussion. There are a lot of organizations that manage a lot of private money that are dealing with the same issues, and we need to think about how we take these principles uh, on board. Uh, and then sort of the last comment I'll, I'll make is, uh, 
you know, to the point that Dan has been very articulate on. So we're talking about demand-driven development. It almost seems just a little anachronistic in an environment where we're seeing the increasing instrumentalization of, of foreign assistance, right? That it, it really is not about necessarily what countries want. It's, it's about how I'm competing with China. It's about shoving somebody else out so that I can come in. It's about do this for me and I'll give you money. If you don't do it for me, I'm not gonna do it. So things that have to do with long-term engagement, value-driven, let's go after the poor, let's create co-prosperity, co does that continue to be as relevant in today's uh, world of big uh, power politics? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Desi. Colin. Um, yeah, sure. Hey, uh, I'm Colin. I work at uh, One Acre Fund. Um, we're an agricultural service provider. Um, we work with um, farmers in seven countries in East and Southern Africa. Um, we're uh, we're going to be serving almost a million next year. Um, we are, we're a nonprofit, but we work like a business. So we sell, uh, we provide asset loans, uh, primarily fertilizer and seed on credit. And our, our clients, the farmers, repay us in full you know, for, those, you know, for those loans. And so we're able to generate about 75% of our revenue uh, for operational costs from what farmers pay us. Um, and, and I just wanted to follow up on I, what, what Tessie said, I think, which is so important on, on this question of you know, whose demand are we talking about? Um, and and are we, are we, is, the, is, the, is, our, is our perspective on demand sort of captured by elites or, or are we really looking at a broad-based demand? And I think that's probably the best thing I can contribute to this discussion is to talk about our work um, as, an agri you know, as, a, as an organization serving rural populations, like what we do to ensure that we are actually responsive to the needs of farmers. Um, you know, we, we look at our farmers as customers. If they, if they don't like the products we're offering, they won't buy them and we'll go out of business. Um, you know, if we think about agricultural development, there's always all these agendas that are set by donors around value chains and this crop or that crop, but we actually have to convince farmers to, to buy those seeds. You know, so adoption becomes really important. And so a lot of our work is about how do we create the right feedback loops with farmers? How do we um, create the behavior change to sort of push that? Um, so that farmers actually feel comfortable investing in these things. And I think a big part of this is just being based in rural areas. We have 7,000 staff, and almost all of them are based in rural areas. We don't even have administrative staff in the U.S. All of our administrative offices are in Kigali and Rwanda, I mean in Kigali and Nairobi, um, and most of our actual staff aren't in the capital cities, because that's a big problem in development, is we tend to be capital city focused. Um, and there's other organizations like us. I mean, there's, I think plenty of organizations are asking this question of, you know, how are we like looking at the populations we serve, not as beneficiaries, but as customers? Um, so I just think it's important we keep sight of, on that sort of part of the demand equation. Thank you. Jebre, thanks for being here. And you've worn a couple of hats where this is, this is relevant. Uh, just as a little bit of context, I'm, I had the privilege of traveling to Eritrea with your wife, Carol Pino, who's a very well-respected and well-renowned African journalist and is someone I would describe as sort of the Eritrea whisperer here in the United States, someone who's got incredible tr trust and credibility in Eritrea. And it's difficult to, to visit Eritrea, and I was only able to do it because of uh, her good offices. And, um, and she uh, you know, taught me a lot about your country. And um, there were several things I was struck by. I mean, Eritrea has asked, invited the, the USAID and invited the World Bank to leave on, at various times, I think it's a function, I think, of, of the history of Eritrea, and it's, um, and it's, it's a very strong independent streak is maybe a way to describe it. But, but you've, you've been around these conversations in a, in a number of different contexts. At the same time, Eritrea has made a lot of progress uh, on a number of different metrics. Not all of them, but there's been a significant number, there's been some progress with, with or without donors. So I think it's, it's interesting to have you, and I really appreciate you being here. So I, I turn the floor over to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Uh, I think I should uh, express uh, my gratitude to Dan for taking the trip to Eritrea at that particular juncture. It was before the peace uh, process had actually uh, been consummated or the agreement reached between Eritrea and Ethiopia. And it was gutsy for somebody like Dan to go there at that time because uh, given the image and the narrative that's been going on about Eritrea, I, I, I could understand if there were some hesitation, you know. So, but he did go there, and he, did, you know, he did see what was happening there on the ground, which is a much greater, you know, sort of testament to really the reality than, you know, uh, having 
preconceived ideas and notions about that. But I think, you know, to come back specifically to the paper, this is really a fantastic paper, a groundbreaking paper, and it has depths. It goes, you know, it sort of telescopes about. Uh, eight decades of uh, development experience, you know, how the developed world has engaged with uh, the developing world. This is, uh, you know, the aid as a kind of a relationship, uh, co uh, as an important ingredient in the re relationship between states is a very fairly new thing, if you look at it, you know, it's uh, just emerged after the Second World War. So, but we have had this kind of relationship between the, particularly the developing world and the developed world, and uh, there has been sort of uh, traditional ways, mechanisms, uh, based on misconceptions, perceptions about the developing world, about its capacity, what it can and cannot do, and even judgments on about the capacities of, you know, the various societies. And on the basis of that, there has been in sort of, sort of hesitation and rejection of the uh, dominating sort of uh, uh, paradigm in respect to aid when we came as independent nation in uh, early 90s in Eritrea. And one of the things we proposed was that we need to, do, to really revisit this issue and have some kind of a different modality of relationship, which is in a sort of a relationship based on partnership. Because what unites everybody you know, on the globe is the, that we really, our inter interests intersect. They, we are joined together. Our destiny is, you know, uh, joined together. That uh, it, we have, we do have share, we share common aspirations. You know, if you ask an, an Indian, an Eritrean, an Ethiopian, a Kenyan, or an American citizen, what does he want for his family, for himself, you know, uh, it wouldn't vary that much. It is the same thing, you know. And in terms of, so we are all different, but let's try to respect also on the basis of that that what hap you know, the goodwill that we generate and the good that we, you know, we create anywhere else, it comes back, you know, sort of to also create greater development, greater growth, which will be, you know, sort of create a much more vital, you know, vital world, which you know, a prosperous world. So we thought that was the underpinning of when we propose what is now being called the, the demand-driven development. And in this respect, you know, what informed our ideas was that the fact that really uh, development aid is a small component of uh, what supports the livelihood of any citizen in the developing world. Most of, the, you know, what uh, to survive or to uh, nurture, you know, what he requires is provided for by his own, you know, by their own uh, endeavor. So that should not be driving the sort of the global, you know, national vision, the national development strategy, the, the aspirations of the people, the policies to uh, sort of realize those aspirations. What should be, you know, deriving will be, you know, the self-reliant efforts that they do undertake. Aid is very important, it's critical. It is an extremely critical ingredient, but it's not you know, the, the, the major driving force in development as we have you know, come to understand it. So therefore, what we thought was that we need a development partnership based on country ownership, based on the assertion of sovereign rights, based on the assertion of democratic rights of the people to shape their own destiny, and on that basis also to you know, sort of to seek uh, uh, solutions, development solutions to their unique situations, you know, in terms of cultural, social, economic, and resource endowment. And on that basis, it's much better to really start from the internally, internally, and articulate these positions internally, and then seek advice, support, take, you know, of whatever sort, from the developing world. In that sense, because, you know, we, we didn't think that we knew everything, but we knew what we didn't have, and we can seek for you know uh, advice and uh, on that. But in the final analysis, the decision was with, with us. So this is what you know how we approach this uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the sort of how you know the, the, how we sh aid should be conducted, and we were seeking partnership rather than this traditional donor recipient kind of relationship. Now. If we come to, you know, move forward a quarter of a century and when we look at the world now, really, in a, globalization has attained such a stage of development that our lives are intertwined so much 
that it is very difficult you know, to talk about age separate from trade or from investment. There are, it's part and a small component of the uh, kind of uh, relationship between nations now. It's integrated. The walls between in the trade and aid is collapsing, as being as sometimes consciously and deliberately by some of the national actors. And so in this kind of situation, it's you know we it's better to really re redes you know redesign and reboot the development uh, relationship in, in this regard and have a different concept and I think uh, this concept of demand driven uh, driven development goes a long way into responding to what is required at this moment. Great. Let me let me try something on the three of you. This issue of technology. Could each of you just talk a little bit about? It, it, how does technology come into this conversation? Because one of the things that I really felt strongly about is that there's a, in the last 25 years, we, we are able to understand a lot more individual preferences because of changes in technology. Could any, any of you, maybe start with you, Colin, just could you just reflect, if I say you, technology, how does that, how has your business changed in terms of demand or signals about what's working and what's not working? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, first, I'd say not all technology is created equal, and I think we have a tendency to like over rely on technology, right? I think largely we're successful just because we have like good people working hard. Yeah. But that being said, I think there are some technologies that have been critical. Um, so one great example would be cell phones. Um, we would not succeed by any means. We would not be, have been able to scale from 60 farmers 10 years ago if it wasn't for cell phones. So cell phones allow farmers to call into a customer service line that we have if they have any concerns, if you know they're getting pressure to repay their loan or some other issue is happening that they're worried about, right? Their fertilizer quality is bad, right? If it wasn't for cell phones, the, you know, we work in very rural areas, so it would take a lot of time for them to you know, walk to our district office to tell us that. We then can use cell phones to run very quick surveys. So we do trainings every week with our farmers. And so we can run on a, you know, on a sample of our farmers, we can run compliance checks, or basically see you know, if they're remembering what they were trying because training is a really, really hard thing to get right. Um, so I think cell phones give us, you know, one of a number of feedback loops with, you know, with farmers. Also, mobile money is absolutely critical in a lot of the countries that we work in, Kenya especially. You know, you can find, you know, uh, you know, a, a farmer in, in rural Kenya can pay her, pay her loan on her cell phone. She can check her balance on her cell phone. Her daughter in Nairobi can like contribute one week to her loan if she wants, all using that technology. Um, and so I think that there are some of these transformational technologies that we really need to appreciate, I and mean, we certainly do. Um, yeah, so a uh, couple of um, observations. So it, it, uh, things like cell phone have really helped to uh, helped us, organizations like ours, um, uh, implement what I would call sort of social accountability programs, right? They become great mechanisms that the community can use to say, hey, listen, um, that's, this school is supposed to be open and it isn't. The teacher didn't show up. There are no books, you know. So, so this becomes an, a way for uh, the 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 community and local civil society to really, you know, create a certain level of accountability to their governments. And it really, we have really observed um, that that uh, democratization. Um, and um, I, I think there's another, you know, another positive aspect of it um, that we have observed. It, it has helped sort of lower barriers to entry for, you know, in terms of the creation of local civil society, indigenous organizations. It is uh, cheaper to, you know, uh, to uh, fundraise to uh, uh, you know, share ideas, to mobilize uh, people, to mobilize resources, all of that you know, very positive. Um, uh, you know, access to knowledge, access to expertise, you know, really have strengthened you know, local actors, local civil society, um, uh, makes data gathering you know, uh, easier, things like GIS and so on become uh, feasible and, and helps to uh, disseminate better information about who's doing what where, all of that. And some of that is very nicely captured in your report. Um, but, you know, technology has risks. And, uh, and so, what, you know, we're an organization that's very concerned with, you know, child protection. Um, 
uh, to the extent that you put the whole world at everybody's finger, uh, you know, fingertips, uh, you also put all kinds of other things at the fingertips of, of youth uh, and children. Um, to the extent that young people, you know, with whom we work, can now express how they feel about a certain government policy and so on, that creates visibility, traceability, and creates potential protection issues. So we need to be mindful of that and be thinking about what mechanisms do we need to put in place uh, to protect those that we're supposed to be, you know, helping. Um, I also think, you know, if it's lowered barriers to entry in general, and, and honestly, technology has lowered barriers to entry in this market, right? We, we, we have seen, you know, a proliferation of excellent and really innovative, you know, uh, organizations that are, you know, new and, and exciting uh, implementing partners on the for-profit and the non-profit side, particularly on the non-profit side, and you've heard me say some of this, um, I think it, it could also be contributing to more, you know, civil society fragmentation. Because if it's true that barriers to entry are lower in terms of, you know, uh, access that, you know, sort of new civil society, you know, entrants, uh, barriers to exit, uh, particularly in the nonprofit world, are very high for all kinds of reasons. And so people enter the market, but they kind of never leave, and everybody's got their own little thing, and everybody's out there trying to, um, you know, uh, 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 Ch you know, chase the same issues, perhaps even the same dollar. I don't think there's anything wrong at all with competition, but we do have, you know, fragmentation. Um, technology can help to, you know, coordinate some of that, but, you know, I don't think we've quite, you know, figured that out in our sector. Great. Jeb Ray? Well, I, I would just like to add what has been said and what has been, uh, you know, sort of elaborated in the report that technology has really been a godsend. Uh, I remember I worked at the uh, planning commission in Ethiopia and I was directing the development programming and the external assistance. And we had at that moment uh, uh, would put in huge, you know, uh, sheets of paper uh, on one side, all the projects and then their the status, you know, uh, from starting from pre-feasibility to feasibility to, you know, sort of uh, the whole process of implementation on a quarterly basis. And it was uh, not only arduous, but what we were tracking was, you know, in terms of time, you know, so much after things had happened. What, to, you know, give, in addition to all that has been said, what technology enables us now is to actually identify the genuine needs and priorities of people or the customers. It identifies, it enables us to track, monitor uh, what's happening in uh, basically close to real time, which is very important. It enables us to evaluate, you know, the output, whatever we have been able to achieve. And in the finance analysis, it also it keeps us to really a decent bit of impact analysis. So this has been, you know, really, a, it's amazing what it can do. So this will be able to, to sort of, uh, you know, so support a new kind of uh, sort of aid relationship in this regard. Okay. So could I ask each of you to talk about the fact that is it, po do you believe that the aid system, the donor system as we know it, is actually capable of responding to demand demands because I, I worry that there's too much of a Faustian bargain implicit in our system and that it's going to be very difficult for us to necessarily, and what I mean by that is I, I think of a country, say, like Kenya, where 80 or 90 percent of what U.S. foreign assistance is is specific to health. Now, I think health is a very important goal. But if you ask what country the, the Kenyans want, they may want agriculture or water or roads, but we're not in a position to offer agriculture, water, or roads because our system only can kind of, the, our political system responds to interest group politics that says this is, the, where what we really ought to be doing is, is primarily health. Now, I'm all in favor of health, as I said, but how do we, how do we, how do we, intermediate, and I think a lot of what the aid system tries to do is try and intermediate in some ways between our political process and what the demands are on the ground, and sometimes that, that's difficult. So I'd welcome any thoughts you have on that. Tessie, can I start with you? Sure. Well, I mean, you've heard me say this earlier. Um, 
Uh, I, I do think we do have a Faustian bargain and the price of support for, the, for our own 150 account is that you know, there's a lot of interest groups and everybody has, everybody's needs have to be served. I, I you know, sort of have observed, you know, I know that the INGO uh, sector here through, you know, for example, interaction, I mean, we all advocate for this minimum level of funding for basic education, this minimal level of funding for health. And anyway, when you add it all up, um, you know, it turns out that, uh, it, you know, we can't, it, it may not be adding up to what the countries want, right? So, because we each have our set of priorities and we think it's super important that those priorities get served, but so does everybody else. And there isn't any sort of kind of mediation, you know, f for that or, or certainly, at the end of the day, it's not like anybody goes back and say, okay, well, gee, how does this amount and mound of stuff that people have asked for translate into what we know that the countries want? And to a certain extent, missions try to do that, right? And that's kind of a, that's, you know, that's been my observation. At the end of the day, they're trying to sort of negotiate that. And sometimes they find themselves in a very uncomfortable position where, and I have, um, some time ago, I was in in Bangladesh, and they had just they had gone through this exercise, and you know they had uh, agreed with the government on what the priorities were going to be, and then it turns out that that's not the kind of money they got. And I actually think, um, just uh, as an outsider, those of you who have been with USAID know a lot better how all of this works. But I think missions are brilliant at figuring out how to take whatever flavor of ice cream is coming your way and serve it up as the kind of flavor that you thought you wanted. <laughs> Tutti frutti. <laughs> you know? And uh, that's no small feat sometimes. And so I, I, you know, I, I, I think that, that that is happening and that we in the you know, advocacy, INGO you know, industry, Development industry, we are very much, you know, part of the problem. Everybody rails against earmarks, and then we just go right back and, and support it. So, um, I also think that there are certain things that that can be helpful in terms of, you know, better coordinating uh, conversations in advance. I, I think things like IATI, right, and and uh, no, get IATI. so the International Aid Transparency. Uh, initiative. So this idea that every donor out there is going to publish their data to a to the a single standard that then makes it very easy, right, for uh, for that to be downloaded, analyzed, and and it gives governments a much better view, right, of who's doing what in their country. It should also give donors a much better view of who's doing what in every uh, country. Uh, so I, I think that kind of initiative where everybody's committed to publishing, where everybody is publishing to the same standard, uh, where there's a group, Publish What You Fund, and you know, in full disclosure, I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of Friends of Publish What You Fund, so I do think it's, a, it's an important initiative because it puts more power in the hands of the government, ostensibly, if we do this right, and it puts more, uh, 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 and it puts more power also in the hands of donors to really see who's doing what and, and improves uh, coordination, in theory. Now here's what happens in practice. Uh, that what is, in, in my opinion, one of the biggest obstacles to publishing to IATI that I have seen uh, and it come, and it you know it certainly applies to my organization is that my management information systems just stink right i i you know i have really bad management information systems and in order for you to be able to publish you know accurate timely data you have to invest in in good you know mis and i think that some of our own agencies here which have legacy systems like the state department and so on they they suffer from some of the same issues it's not they that do. that they don't want to necessarily that they refuse that for political reasons to publish the diary it's just that their legacy systems don't easily let them to and so it takes a lot of investment to do that so there's another piece of it which has to do with investment in better technology frankly and uh, better information systems to facilitate some of that so uh Anyways, just to say, uh, it's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. 
Others want to, Colin? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think Tessie and Gerberi can really speak to a, to a high level view that is, you know, that I can't speak to. But maybe to give a, a specific example of an avenue that I think is very exciting is, is the social enterprise space. Um, and, I, and I want to talk about how, so social enterprises, you know, organizations like ours, but there's many more, I mean, Phoenix or Living Goods in East Africa, Sanergy, I mean, organizations that generate revenue off of their products, right, that see, see their, their population that they serve as, as, as clients. Um, I think this is a really exciting growing space. And I think on the political side, domestically here, I mean, I can certainly say from the meetings I have on the Hill, Democrats and Republicans alike are incredibly enthusiastic about models like this. Because I think there's a powerful, it gives them a powerful message to their constituents that we're, you know, we're teaching people to fish, we're not giving them fish, right? And that resonates so strongly, especially in the US. So I think there's actually a real argument that can get the political support you know, for this sector. And on the, the host government side of things, I mean, that's, I've been working with host governments for the past four years, and you know, I can say that there is a huge amount of support in the African governments where we work for you know, help in sectors where markets are failing, right? And I think the US has a really unique role to play that I don't think a lot of other of these new actors are gonna play in focusing on sort of long-term loss-leading investments, right? If you're gonna be working in rural Kenya, you're gonna lose money for a while. I mean, we generate tens of millions of dollars off of off of the revenue from farmers, but we lose money every year. So I think donors like the US to be able to partner with a government like Kenya and say, you know, we're gonna help you build this sector and we are gonna like sort of pave the way for the private sector to eventually be successful, right, to serve these populations, but we're willing to sort of invest and lose money for a while as, as that happens. And so I think, you know, new instruments like the Development Finance Corporation are really exciting, you know, that have this sort of mission focus. Um, but I do actually think that this is an exciting time um, to sort of invest in this new approach. So, Jebre? Uh, well, I think, you know, what Tess was saying about, you know, coordination, having better coordination, and particularly if that coordination could be achieved within country coordination, for example, and where the nation is in a position to sort of interact with donors on the basis of their strengths. So yes, could, is full spectrum, you know, it could address any need that they have, but given the legislative, you know, sort of uh, uh, these silos that uh, uh, go in, then it would be better to sort of, if all the donors act in concert, in a sense that complementing each other's you know, works, but having their own areas of specialization, that will work. I remember, you know, for example, when we wanted some advice on uh, what you call articulating uh, mining legislation, you know, we went to the Norwegians because they, you know, they do have fantastic you know, legislation for their own country, so we tapped that. You know, and it will, you know, anytime we needed some kind of support, which called the, the World Bank, we had a very good, good relationship, and we'll ask, you know, as Dan was saying before in the pregame, to certain people, you know, who are really, you know, huge knowledge uh, depths, and we'll try to access that. So that is one of the things that we need to do. But I think maybe, you know, uh, this might be extremely naive on my part, but one of the things that we really need to do, address in terms of uh, making the aid more robust, more effective, uh, USAID, is the fact that uh, we need to have a strategic shift in terms of how it is per uh, perceived. There is a perception problem. It's, you know, aid has a bad image now. It's, you know, look at us as sort of gratis, you know, hand out and, and stuff. Whereas it is really a strategic investment in the, you know, particularly at this juncture. It's a strategic investment in the economic relationship and developing in a sort of a global partnership with the developing world. It's, and that has to be recognized and that has to be really addressed in that regard. Now we are talking about this myopic, short-term kind of uh, interest-driven, you know, sort of, uh, 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 as indicated in the paper, uh, driving the whole process. That has to be really, you know, that, that, that fight has to be really waged if we are going to transform the way aid is conducted and delivered and the, the magnitude of that aid. Because as of now, if you look at it, you know, it's really, you know, pe people, 
have a neg negative perception, whereas this is really an entry point, an insertion point for you know, uh, uh, creating a more, much more r robust and much more you know, sort of uh, prosperous global relationship in this country. And it's a very competitive field. You can't get, uh, you know, for, for example, Africa on the cheap anymore. You can't, you know, there's, you have to- You can't so get Africa on the cheap anymore. That's, that's the tweetable line that you're right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what I've said, Jebre, is if we don't meet the hopes and aspirations of countries, countries will take their business to the Chinese. So yeah. I suspect that's what you mean by that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was, that's sobering. Can I ask yeah. just Africa? Oh, a, a question. Sorry. Yeah, I keep on. Um, because something that Jabra said, um, you know, triggered. So you, as, as you note in the report, and, and, as, and as everybody here knows, I mean, uh, development assistance, right? Uh, the 150 account, what other bilaterals and multilaterals have, is just a tiny little fraction of what the entire pie. what the entire pie uh, really is. Um, and at, which, which actually, to a certain extent, should be hugely liberating to donors, right? Because you don't have to try to cover the whole waterfront. You can be really strategic. Um, in theory. In theory, right. And so, uh, but that really does uh, require that, you know, how we do business, all of us, uh, you know, be really rethought. Uh, but. And so I wonder if, if we have is, uh, and, I, and I don't think that we have, I don't have a magic answer for that, but, but uh, we are at, at, a, at a kind of interesting point, Moment. right, um, where it's not about, you know, now, that is true in certain countries and not, you know, in others, and for certain types of uh, development assistance, um, you know, and, and not others. I mean, we haven't, you know, a lot of this conversation uh, might be about your traditional development aid. Um, and, and then we have to think about where does humanitarian assistance fit into all of this? Uh, do, are, are, do these same principles apply? Can we and should we be you know, equally strategic? Are we leveraging the same resources? The answer is no, but we, we need to sort of dissect that uh, as well. Exactly. OK, let me open this up. I know there's some smart people here. I, I want to. Um, hear from uh, some of my favorite people. Um, so who's got, who wants to raise their hand? We're his favorite people. You're my favorite people <laughs> on the panel, but. So, okay, so it's real, oh, this is, the silence is deafening, it's killing me, so awkward. Um, okay, I wanna hear from my friend from the MCC. I wanna hear from my friend from FHI 360. Uh, and I also, uh, Let's see, I want to hear from my friend John Lamb, who used to be at the World Bank. So let me start with my friend right here. Uh, Casey. Casey Dunning. Thanks, Dan, and um, thanks, all of you. Um, my question, in, in the report, you kind of lay out the life cycle of a given investment. So there's design and planning, implementation, and outcomes. And um, I'm at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. We have a demand-driven uh, uh, approach to development. Um, and we see strong partner country engagement in, on the first two aspects of that life cycle. But when it comes to the kind of post-investment um, evaluation outcomes and learning, uh, there's been far more variance in terms of partner country engagement. Um, you can, there, I'm sure there are many reasons as to why that is, but I wondered if you had thoughts on the kind of learning and evaluation side of demand-driven uh, development to make sure that not only MCC and um, other donors are, are learning from our results, but also how to kind of get more buy-in from our partner countries and civil society and, and those with whom we work in country on the kind of the last, uh, the post-investment part of the cycle. Thanks. Patrick Oh. Uh, hi. Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I just want to um, applaud you, applaud CSIS, applaud the team for raising the issue of demand-driven development. The idea that countries should own the programs, that their priorities should drive the where investments are made, 
is not a new idea, but it's not a popular idea right now, or it's not, it's not an idea that has a lot of traction right now. So I think it's, it's a very useful thing for CSIS to be um, highlighting this as an important, appro important concept, as an important angle for um, how we think about development financing. And to reiterate that uh, to have real effective programs, the financing that goes into those programs has to meet the, the um, countries or the communities or the, 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 the folks who are going to be putting those resources to work uh, around their priorities and not just our priorities. So Dan, you. You've made that point, um, I think, very eloquently, and it's an important point. Um, my, you know, what I'm interested in is how you now take what is a pretty common sense notion and one that is, I think, embraced in general by the development community and translate it into policy action. And that, I guess, requires advocacy. And um, this, w this is an example of, of advocacy, but it's, it's, you're kind of uh, shouting into a, a strong wind. And so I'd, be, I'd like to hear from the panelists your view about how these ideas, which are, are um, articulately uh, uh, described in this report um, can get traction in the uh, uh, traction with decision makers. My friend John Lamb. And I also want to hear from Rahula from the Asian Development Bank. Uh, thanks. I wasn't expecting to be called on, but. Uh, You're one of my favorite people, John. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I don't know, as I was listening, I was playing with some ideas. The, I remember uh, in the field that you know I come from of agriculture that there was a shift that occurred from supply-driven uh, agriculture towards market-driven agriculture. But it, sometimes it went too far, and I think that that may be the case here. Maybe we should be talking about, in the next generation, supply and demand-driven development, not just demand-driven development. And if you play with that idea, possibly, it might be possible to uh, apply sort of a market systems approach and say, what is it? Since all markets function on who needs it, who wants it, who's willing to pay, and who's able to pay, to go back and look and say, what is it about the current situation that does not cause supply and demand to match at the point at which uh, you reach an optimal development outcome? And it may be possible to apply some techniques from other areas and, uh, and come up with some new thinking on this. Because I'm a fe I fear that, from my own experience, and I think yours, that the shift towards demand development has also had undesirable impacts, one of them being elite capture, which I always also thought of when I saw the title of this event. Uh, secondly, that the elite capture almost places the urban elite uh, on top of the rural elite, except in cases of what like Colin described, where you're already in the rural area. And so, in a sense, the move towards country ownership has created an elite, an urban elite, whose characteristics and thinking is not that different to everybody in this room. Uh, and therefore, it doesn't automatically respond to, quote, real demand in rural areas and the very poor people. So I think that we haven't gone far enough in terms of the decentralization or de de devolution of, the, uh, of where the demand is coming from and understanding it. And at the same time, in a sense, we've created a monster that isn't yet ready to take on the whole field. So I guess in summary, sub, sub supply and demand de driven development and recognize that the elite capture is partly our own creation. Some of my favorite people are elites, John. I mean, come on, I don't know, what the, <laughs> what's the problem? <laughs> They've got the best dinner parties, what's the problem? So, Rahula. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rahula Osman, Information Development Bank. Uh, thank you for the great report, and I see Asia Development Bank as 100% demand driven, which is a great news, and uh, we encourage other colleagues to follow. Uh, uh, I, we, we discussed earlier also, the, the, there is a challenge in um, 
in uh, in the definition of uh, demand driven uh, uh, and i was wondering uh, um, how from your experiences my I, my intervention will be to ask two questions from the panelists this time uh, uh, how you define uh, this uh, demand driven in, in a f more fragile context uh, versus other other contexts uh, and 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 the, the second thing is the donor donor fragmentation when it comes to uh, uh, um, engagement and development uh, and uh, also it goes to uh, the reason is a more centralized uh, donor approach to to uh, develop and decisions are made more mostly in headquarters and then implementation uh, at the country level, how you synchronize and how, how donor countries can decentralize some of the decision makers to make sure that they, they can sit with their other development partner, par partners and countries to, to, to help uh, own those countries. So how that, from your experience, will, will, uh, will, will work to, to brief. All right, let me take a crack at Patrick's question, and then I'd welcome the panelists to take on any or all the other things that I've put on the table. And let me also take a stab at the elite capture issue, because I think, John, that's a good one. Um, my, my line is, if we don't meet the hopes and aspirations of developing countries, they're going to take their business to the Chinese, is, is, the, uh, is, is my view. And so I think that we're, um, I think Jebre's point about Africa can't be taken on the cheap anymore is a good way to describe it. So I think there's a little bit of a, perhaps it's a useful exercise, let's just use Africa as a context. There's a little bit of a, perhaps a bidding war to, if I can, it's not exactly the right way to describe it, but I think that having some sort of an alternate model or competitor, I think is a way in which, uh, if, if we've had sort of a monopsony, I guess, is that the, you know, sort of a, there's a unit, one supplier, sort of Western supply of aid, perhaps having some sort of competition is a way for us to kind of think the, rethink the industry or the business. So I think that would be kind of one thing. I think on the issue of elite capture, I think that's a good question because I think, you know, if, if my friend from Oxfam, uh, Paul O'Brien, was here, he would say that that's actually part, part of the, part of what we're doing in development is empowering different stakeholders in a society and perhaps sort of breaking existing sort of uh, power arrangements or however you would want to describe it. So I think this is a, I think this is a good question. I also think, um, it, you know, there's a, I do think that there are a number of countries that just came up earlier, I think what Jebre said in the pre-game event that we did, where there's lots of countries where you have sort of aid dependency, countries that have aid dependency, and so you have elites that become really good at playing the donor game and playing donors off and sort of work, you know, mo manipulating them or emotionally manipulating them or politically manipulating or however you want to describe it. So I think it's a heck of a question. My, my answer, I guess, would be is I think we probably need some more political scientists and anthropologists to understand what we're getting ourselves into. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's so that we're not um, American teenagers walking into um, some sort of a, you know, some kind of a biker bar that we don't, they don't know what they're getting themselves into, or if I can put it that way, that we're not babes in the woods, if I can leave it at that. Okay, Tessie. All right, so a few comments. Um, to Casey's point about, um, you know, th that you've got uh, good engagement on the front end, a lot less interest on the back end. I don't know enough about that, um, but just sort of, again, reflecting on, on our uh, experience at PLAN, um, you, I, I guess who is driving that evaluation? Where is it going? How is it being used? And how is it benefiting you know, the, the various stakeholders? Because there's a, there's a demand-driven approach to this as well, right? And so if this is seen as kind of a check the box that you, know, that you as the donor need to do, and it's really going to do nothing for me, uh, it's not going to get me more resources. It's not going to help me implement better. It's not going to make me look good, get an award, whatever. Um, uh, chances are that there won't be much of a demand for that because you already got the money. Thank you very much. Uh, and so uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, we've we've um, uh, had uh, success getting buy-in uh, from the community you know, uh, getting buy-in for the community and demand for the community for all of those aspects. So, and, and engaging them uh, in the design and then in the, in the evaluation has been a good way of making sure that, there's, that there is a sort of grassroots demand for that type of thing that is not just coming from the top. 
take it for whatever that's <laughs> for whatever that's worth. Um, the um, the issue about uh, elites. Um, you know, uh, uh, well, th so that's the age-old uh, problem. It is, some of it has to do with uh, looking at how your own processes are geared to um, letting new players in and new voices in, uh, right? Uh, uh, and, and to your point, um, yeah, there's a whole, you know, just like there's a giant industry that's been created here, you know, uh, now with actually more towards local ownership and so on, there's a giant industry that's being created in very many places, but I would question whether a lot of those indigenous organizations are there to, you know, to uh, give uh, a voice to local uh, issues and local needs, or whether they're there to support whatever they think that the donor wants. And um, and so uh, so number and, and especially when dealing with a donor such as the U.S. government is very difficult, complicated, risky, and so on and so forth. So uh, and and AID to their credit uh, are some of the redesign transformation stuff is meant to again reduce those barriers to entry, allow for new players. But I will tell you my own experience has been having been part of some of the things that you describe in the report around co-creation and so on, you might have a great co-creation exercise, right? Uh, and, and which is meant to allow players that aren't geared to just be writing proposals for AID to come in and give their new ideas. But if after the co-creation and after you've signed the contract, you then go back to managing that contract or that agreement exactly the same way as you manage everything else, then that whole giant thoughtful exercise goes out the window. Um, and, and so I go back to the first point that I made, that to really do the man-driven development, which really should mean putting, you know, putting the power at, at the country it, with those marginalized groups and so on, it means that you need to transform yourself. And um, and doing that is really you know uh, a very difficult thing, and and sometimes it's not politically convenient. Um, and uh, and then that um, that leads me to Patrick's point about how to advocate. Uh, I mean, so this report is really important. It comes at a really interesting time when there may not be that much of an interest, certainly by decision makers here. Um, in terms of paying attention to that, but I, I you know, um, I, I do think that uh, moments like this, this particular event, continuing to invest in better, you know, uh, evaluations, getting better data out there, um, you know, organizations like MFAN, I mean, you know, it's up to all of us to figure out how we insert this conversation into, into the uh, trans, more transactional aid instrumentalization agenda. Um, and, and I think it's all of us together. And, and the last thing I'll say is um, that organizations like mine need to be part of that transformation process. We need to be willing to commit to that. It's not good enough for me to just say, well, somebody else start. Um, I think we need to start and consider how we need to change how we do business, and including uh, on, on the private donor side, having uh, different uh, 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 communication, uh, perhaps more uh, transparent and thoughtful communication with our own donors, and stop sort of saying, give me money for education, I'm gonna guarantee that I'm gonna like, you know, educate like 10,000 girls, uh, you know, because I know that that's gonna attract money. We need to be really a, a lot more thoughtful about, um, you know, how we mobilize resources ourselves and the type of conversations we have with private donors, not just the legislators in this country. Exactly. Yeah, just very quickly, just on Casey's question about M&E, um, this is something near and dear to us as we've tried to figure out how to present our M&E results. We spend a lot of money investing in, in rigorous M&E and how do we get governments to care about it and I think we've learned a lot of hard lessons. And I would say the biggest lesson is 
for governments to care about it, it has to align to their political priorities, right? So a few like illustrative examples of that, right? You know, we, we used to present all of our impact numbers, but that like none of the government officials we work with care about that. What matters is bringing them out to the field, having them meet farmers, or frankly, when they go out just to like visit their families and our farmers talk to them, because that's when they really see and believe that, you know, the, their constituents are gonna care about them because they like our work, right? So we, at some point we just stopped even worrying about giving them those impact numbers and we focus on that field exposure. Um, another example is in Rwanda, like we, we do a lot with agroforestry and I remember this one experience in Rwanda where we presented all these numbers about all these trees our farmers planted, planted these grevillea trees and the government just didn't care at all. And they're like, didn't you see President Kagame like two weeks ago said that we need to focus on fruit trees where are your fruit trees? And we're like, uh, I don't know, how many fruit trees have we planted, right? So like, we had to scramble to like, figure that out. But because like, he, for very good reason, like, wanted the government to focus, start focusing on fruit trees, and we didn't have the data, right? So we just didn't do a good job of like, figuring out what data really mattered to the government for those reasons. So I think that's what we constantly try to figure out. Your questions brings out an essential question in development. Unless there is a true commitment, unless the government is really committed to change the situation, to transform the society in all respects, no matter what kind of incentive you give them, that incentive will be used only temporarily and it will never be in a sort of sustainable and long term. It reminds me of uh, the PRSP process, if you remember, you know, when there was uh, the debt relief process and you know, structural adjustment was thrown by the side. Uh, in order to, to get debt relief, all the governments were expected to produce the poverty reduction strategy papers. And I had the opportunity to review one of them for uh, one country for the World Bank. And it was very, you know, sort of revealing. You know, the, the people, the ministers we were talking to were, were really totally only interested in getting the money. That whole process that was supposed to have been undertaken was fraudulent, basically. And that's it, you know, you are doing it for external accountability. You are not doing it for internal accountability. What Colin was saying, if really it's committed and it is, you know, sort of in the interest of the government and the people themselves and they are going to be held accountable, then they will do it rigorously. Otherwise, it's simply in you know, a sort of like pushing on a string. It, it won't happen. They will, you know, you play games and, you know, they play games. So that's the end of it. You know, that's uh, one thing. Uh, to the other question that uh, was, uh, I, I, I think, with respect to how to deal the, in the image process, and I think what we need to do is to expand the development space here in the United States. That development space that takes into account the fact that, you know, the aid is a small component of a larger whole, but an integrated whole, the business, the trade, and everything. We have to expand it, you know, take it out of Washington. There's already the, you know, the interest group for agriculture is very well represented. Some of the high tech, high manufacturing, you know, is also represented in the through lobbies and everything. But take it out. I mean, take, you know, expand it to the regions that they have an interest, that they see the benefits of what is happening. You know, this is really, a win-win situation. You know, this is, you know, you know if you element, elevate it from being making it in a sort of demand room to, to a partnership, this is real partnership. And in that case, you know, you will see that the, the constituency for aid for development will be much broader. And it, you know, uh, and you'll, other thing is to address the image problem. For example, you know, enabling small business to be, you know, on this board, de-risking the whole thing, of, uh, creating the new facilities that are coming. It's, I mean, 60 million for the 60 billion. It's, it's peanuts when you compare it with the trillions that you know the Chinese are prepared to give. But expand that and enable them. And uh, another thing is to address this uh, image problem of the developing world as if you know that you know it's really it's uh, uh, what you call it scary out there you know to try to encourage them and i think these are some things that i would think of which be one quick thing on that the to, to debra's point about uh, get the image that the developing world is a scary place and so on. And here again, honestly, as, a, as an INGO, I think we also need to um, confess that we might be part of the problem. Why? Because I'm out there looking for money from donors. 
and uh, you're not going to get any money if the story is, hey, everything's great. <laughs> I'd like some money. Some more money, right? please. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so it's about <laughs> calibrating the message. But that's why I think that you know, educating the public about what is going on, how your money is being leveraged, what has already been achieved, and, and, and stop sort of wallowing in the terribleness of the situation is something that needs to be done. But let's just be really clear that, that, that um, uh, poverty and misery sells, uh, and it also sells uh, we can politically. Over, we can overshoot. Yeah, exactly. I was going to call it development porn, but development. you know what I mean, right? But.